for me, uh, when I think of gut health, I think of um, first how well the animals are able to utilize the nutrients because the, the less efficient they are at utilizing nutrients, the more nutrients escape to the distal digestive tract that can cause problems, you know, with the um, proliferation of non-beneficial microorganisms. So I also think of epithelial cells integrity, um, how we are able to influence gut microflora, uh, as well as the immune response at the mucosa level. Welcome to another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. I'm your host today, Kelly Walmsley, and I'm joined by Dr. Alukosi, um, who is an associate professor at uh, University of Georgia in the Poultry Science Department. Hello, how are you doing today? Oh, well, I'm doing very well, and thank you for pronouncing that name right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks uh, for, for joining us today, and I guess, you know, if you don't mind just to give the, re the listeners or viewers a little bit of background to how you got to where you are today. Good question. Thank you for having me. Um, I came to United States a, maybe 21 years ago now, and I did my PhD at Purdue University. Of course, prior to that, I did my degrees in Nigeria, Obafemi Awolowo University. So I, I spent about seven years at Purdue, PhD, postdoc, and then I took a faculty position in Scotland, where I was for eight years. And now I've been in the University of Georgia for the last six years. So uh, as an associate professor in poultry science. Well, I was talking about your background in kind of um, working in the area of nutrition and gut health and um, the intersection of them and using nutrition to influence gut health, right? Yeah. So I guess gut health is pretty broad. Um, so what do you mean by gut health or what does it mean to you? Yeah. So for me, uh, when I think of gut health, I think of, um, first, how well the animals are able to utilize the nutrients because the, the less efficient they are at utilizing nutrients, the more nutrients escape to the distal digestive tract that can cause problems, you know, with the, um, proliferation of non-beneficial microorganisms. So I also think of epithelial cells integrity, um, how we are able to influence gut microflora uh, as well as the immune response at the mucosa level. So those are the things that come to my mind when I think of gut health. Right. And so then you're thinking in, in some of the research that we're going to talk to about today um, that your lab's been working on is in the area of functional fibers and using um, functional fibers, a mixture of, of, of them with prebiotics, um, and then some enzymes um, to kind of manipulate gut health and improve um, the performance of the bird too, as well, right? Yes, yes. So can you talk to us a little bit about um, kind of the, the what a symbiotic is? That's something, you know, most people have heard of symbiotics. Um, but stembiotics is kind of a newer term in the past five years, maybe, if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, just about that. If I can give a little bit of background. Sure. See, um, I, I did, when I was working in Nigeria uh, for my master's, part of what I did was to actually collect um, free-range chickens, uh, remove the gizzard, and look at the different things that animals pick up as they just go around scavenging, if we can use that term. Can be pretty random, right? <laughs> oh, you come across very interesting things. But, but what that teaches me is that the animals really have access and they, they uh, you know, if we give them the natural environment to just roam around, they pick up quite a few things. I mean, a lot of things that will be surprising when you look at it. Right. And, Consequently, all of these, m many of them do not really contribute to their nutrition, mm -hmm. okay? So they have functional roles that they play. And those are the kind of things that have been driving my thinking with regards to how we can use nutrition to drive gut health. Ah, interesting. Okay. Yeah, so but specifically to the question that you asked with regards to steam biotics, it's essentially uh, the combination of xylanase and some functional fibers, maybe like 
um, some zealous oligosaccharides. Now, these functional fibers are not expected to really um, contribute much to fermentation. They are really not, because they, their quantity is very small, mm. but they are expected to stimulate the development of microorganisms that will selectively ferment uh, products that will produce metabolites that are beneficial to gut health. Okay. So their mean effect is supposed to be through butyrogenic uh, microorganisms. And what are some of those metabolites that you're talking about? So in the end, the key metabolites that we are going to be interested in will be the short-chain fatty acids. Right, okay. Um, because, you know, those are important, especially to the uh, micro, I mean, to the uh, epithelial, epithelial cells. Right. So that's, well, that's one of the things. But apart from that, we are also interested in the kind of the profile of prebiotic oligosaccharides that are generated in situ within the digestive mm. tract. Mm. Because sometimes we... Uh, supplement prebiotics to diet. But my interests have been to compare how the prebiotics that we supplement to diet compare to the effect of the additives that we give to diet, I mean, that we give to chickens, mm -hmm. and how these additives help the animal to generate prebiotics oligosaccharides by themselves. Mm. Uh, now, this is something I've been working on for the past 10, 12 years. I see. And uh, it's one of the areas that we are focusing on as we study gut health effect. Right. And so in one of your most recent publications, you um, looked at some different diets um, with, uh, in, in, with functional fibers um, and looking at, if I'm, if I'm not, correct me if I'm wrong, more on the, the wheat barley side and then also some corn based. Mm -hmm. And you saw more of an impact um, with the wheat and barley based diets. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So it appears that the reason why we're able to see more effect with wheat barley based diet, and for one thing, we know that these have more of the fiber that are fermentable more readily mm. than, fermentable than corn. But um, secondly, these um, high fibrous feedstuffs, barley and wheat, they may cause lower nutrient digestion as well as lower uh, growth performance. I mean, that this is, I, I say that with caution because that's not always the case. Sure. But what happens is that when you feed a feedstuff that gives you room to improve your response, you're more likely going to see a response. And I, I have to take a cough now. <laughs> so when you feed a feedstuff that gives you room for more improvement in your response, perhaps if those feedstuffs reduce nutrient utilization or de depress performance, especially in cases where you challenge the animals, because that's something that we've done, we've been doing uh, in some of our recent studies, when you have a feedstuff that gives you such effect, you are more likely going to see a positive response to your additive. Sure. And that is one of the things that we're thinking about. Um, because generally we found, and not just in this study, but in other studies, when we look at the key factors that may influence the production of prebiotics in the digestive tracts, we found that fiber is the most important component. Mm. So in that particular study, I think we look at four factors. We look at the level of protein, the level of fiber, supplementation with uh, carbohydrates, or supplementation with proteins. But we found that the strongest factor was fiber. Uh, and that builds, I mean, that helps with the question that you are asking, while uh, a diet based on wheat or on barley produce this effect more than a diet that is based on corn. Right. So I think it's the key driver will be the fiber there. So you're not just looking, thinking, I mean, when we're, we're looking at enzyme application, we're thinking about substrate, right? Yes. That, that those enzymes can, can react upon. Um, but you're, you're also suggesting that when we're talking about 
prebiotics, um, we should also be thinking about substrate then in that kind of a similar way, right? Essentially, yes. That's, that's, the, that's the point I'm trying to make. Because, you know, our diets have different um, components, um, sure. which you know, we, we, the, in, among the components that we've looked at, uh, we see that fiber is a very, very important factor, especially when it comes to generation of prebiotics within the animal themselves, how they are able to um, break down this fiber and produce prebiotic oligosaccharides in the distal digestive tract. Oh, that's very interesting. Kemen calls all poultry experts. You already know the key to a profitable operation is healthy, productive birds. Our team of poultry experts are driven by curiosity to develop science-backed ingredients and solutions that help you maintain feed and water quality, improve intestinal health, optimize nutrition, and eliminate pathogens. Learn more today by diving in at kemen.com forward slash poultry to learn more. So have, I guess, um, you know, thinking about for maybe some of the U.S. audience, um, you know, and where maybe wheat barley isn't as popular to be fed. Um, but we've experienced, and others probably throughout the world have experienced some poor quality ingredients, and especially like in soybean meal at times, um, higher fiber soybean meal, for instance. So um, have you done work in that area and have some you know, suggestions for maximizing the potential of that fiber and that substrate um, within those diets? Yes, uh, we have studies where we're looking at um, low-protein soybean meal. We deliberately created low-protein soybean meal by adding soy hull to regular soybean meal. So we're going from, let's say, 48% crude protein soybean meal to 42%. Mm-hmm. By adding soy hull, you know, essentially we're using a 9 to 1 ratio of soybean meal to soy hull. Now, that does come with challenge. I mean, if I'm, if I can start by saying that we actually did see a very robust growth performance response, especially in the earlier part of growth phase, especially in the starter phase. By the time you get to the finisher phase, the difference has narrowed, but the difference is still there. That we see that the birds that were fed um, the low protein soybean meal had higher weight gain at the end compared to the one that were fed the uh, standard serving meal. But that has to be treated with caution because some people will talk about the trips inhibitor that's present in soy hull and what effect that could have. So we followed up when we see the effect that we saw at first. We followed, up, we followed it up with another experiment where we use graded levels of additional soy hull in the serving meal. And so as you as you add more soy hull to the serving meal, you are go, you might have a, a decrease in performance. And that's a possibility. Uh, apart from the fact that that's, that can happen, you know that as you dilute the serving meal, you need to add more um, amino acid. Sure. <laughs> because you are reducing the level of amino acid. So whereas we see that there is potential of using additional soy hull, and there is no doubt about that. To so improve um, the gut health effect of soybean meal, um, we have to remember that there is no one size fits all approach to this. Sure. Um, but I have no doubt in my mind from the results that we have seen that there is scope for using soybean, reduced protein soybean meal, not by just reducing the protein, but by adding soy hull to the regular soybean meal. We did see effect on growth performance, positive effect. And we're still looking at what that might mean, especially when animals are challenged uh, with coccidiosis, which is a worldwide problem. And the earlier indication is that there are are positive effects. But these still have to be um, confirmed, as well as one has to be careful in the way you interpret the data. Yeah. Um, I'm not like saying that we have to just use low protein soybean meal, but I'm very certain based on our experience that there's benefit to using additional so- fiber from soy hull. That might be applicable in some 
production settings, but maybe not in all. Uh, and so one needs to take all of those into consideration. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Olokusi. I thank you for having me. And if I can just make a, an acknowledgement. Absolutely. Because, you know, I have had quite a number of students that have helped me over the years. Yes. Well, I have to thank them for all that they have done and that they keep doing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and thank you for having me. Thank you, um, and thank you to our listeners and viewers. This is another episode of the Poultry Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, and we'll catch you next time. Thank you, bye.